Washington Nationals are sitting high atop the NLE standings, but the Mets are lurking right behind them. They go head-to-head this weekend. The pregame Saturday is at 6 Eastern and Sunday at 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio. Debate. First take. Starts now. Hello, everybody, and welcome into First Take on a Tuesday. This is Kit Bayless and Molly Karam here in studio with Stephen A. Smith in NYC. Good morning, Stephen A. Good morning. How y'all doing? Excellent. I cannot wait to hear what you're about to say on First Take, my friend. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I am here. Some big news coming up. A lot of quarterback talk. Johnny Menzel, Russell Wilson. But first, we kick things off with Tom Brady. The NFL and NFLPA are in talks regarding a possible settlement over Tom Brady's four-game suspension for his role in the Deflategate sandal. Sources are telling ESPN and Fox Sports, who first reported the sides, had started talking. Now, Stephen A., you talked to some people this morning. What are you hearing? Well, within the last hour, within the last hour, I just heard that uh, Tom Brady... Uh, suspension will likely be upheld. Now, we all recognize that anything's possible. Uh, You know, obviously, minds can change. But from what I'm hearing, uh, within the next 24 to 48 hours, the NFL will announce that they are upholding the four-game suspension against Tom Brady. He will serve his four-game suspension. They know and expect the National Football Players Association, National Football League Players Association, uh, to appeal that decision to file an injunction. Uh, so Tom Brady will still be able to play and all of this other stuff. But at the end of the day, the NFL uh, does not have any fear whatsoever about Tom Brady taking this to federal court, Skip Bayless. They are fully aware that that is a possibility. They are confident that they will win and they are going to uphold this four-game suspension from everything I'm hearing, barring a last-minute change. That is the plan. Within the next 24 to 48 hours, he's going to serve his four-game suspension. And not only am I hearing that, Skip, I'm hearing some of the reasons why, uh, just to throw it out there, remember when we had conversations about his text messages and refusing to show it? I'm hearing that Tom Brady actually destroyed his cell phone. Um, I'm hearing that when you talk about the uh, one million dollar fine and the confiscation of a first and fourth round pick that ultimately owner Robert Kraft accepted, you have to remember, uh, you know, in Spygate back in 2007, uh, Bill Belichick, when, when they when the Patriots and Bill Belichick was were fined, uh, apparently there's some language um, in that agreement, in that fine that ultimately was handed down to him, that if something like this happened again. You're talking about Bill Belichick being banned, which in some folks' eyes may have facilitated Robert Kraft showing a willingness to accept uh, the penance and the penalty that Roger Goodell handed down to him. But at the end of the day, all of that is water under the bridge as it pertains to the Patriots. They've accepted their penalty. Bill Belichick is still their coach. They are moving on. But as it pertains to Tom Brady, the NFL is very, very confident uh, that in their ruling that he deserves a four-game suspension. From what I'm being told, they're not going to budge one bit. And if he wants to go to federal court, it will be at his own peril. Because remember, he goes to federal court. Then you're not talking about him lying to the NFL, potentially, you know, supposedly or whatever the case may be. You're talking about him having to give testimony under oath, uh, along with the ball boy, the equipment managers and all of those other guys, whoever was involved with the whole deflate gate scandal. They'd have to give a deposition and they have to give sworn testimony, which means that any questions could be asked, not just pertaining to the flake gate, but potentially beyond that. And they don't think that Tom Brady and the New England Patriots want that at all. So they are holding firm to the four game suspension and barring any last minute wiggle room or what have you. That is the way that it is going to be. Tom Brady will miss the first four games of this NFL season. At least that's what I'm told to expect in the next 24 to 48 hours. (laughs) barring any last minute, you know, any last minute adjustments. Okay, before I respond to what you just told me, told us, question, is it possible that Roger Goodell and company, Troy Vincent and company, all the NFL people involved here are floating a trial balloon to, to try to continue to pressure Tom Brady to take some sort of settlement here, a two-game suspension? Do you, you think there's just, any I, method to the madness here? Skip, Skip in, you know, in all honesty, that's a better question to ask for somebody like Adam Schefter or Chris Mortensen, insiders on the National Football League, 
who have done this for decades, who are incredibly exceptional at what they, they do, are. um, and probably know a hell of a lot more. Uh, I'm sorry, definitely know a hell of a lot more than me, particularly as it pertains to your question. All I'm qualified to tell you, Skip, is what I have heard in the last hour, which is why I picked sure. up the phone and called you and said we need to leave the show with it because Love I'm it. hearing that this is what's going down. Love it and certainly trust your source. So now back to my response. If, in fact, four games are upheld through the appeals process, I would not at all be surprised here, Stephen A. Smith. I have told you from the start, remember from day two, I said on this show, sitting in this chair, Tom Brady is preparing to go to court. So through the entire appeals process, Brady's legal team made it painfully clear to Roger Goodell, we are poised and prepared and more than willing to go to court to take this to the, to the legal end. So in the end of the appeals process, why should Roger Goodell compromise at all? Why should he soften his sentence? What good would it do him to look a little wishy-washy here if, in fact, he's going to have to go before a federal judge to, to argue his case? So I, I'm just thinking that because we, we kept hearing that a number of owners, which I do not doubt, are quietly urging Roger Goodell to toe that line, to hold firm with the four-game suspension because they believe the New England Patriots have been you know, serial cheaters over the years, that they've had a culture of cheating, and they want the golden boy quarterback to be the focal point of how New England is going to have to pay for this. No golden boy quarterback, no Super Bowl MVP for the first four games. That's what a lot of owners want. So Goodell's feeling a lot of internal pressure. You just mentioned mm -hmm. Mr. Kraft, Bob Kraft, the owner of the Patriots. Well, he rattled his saber for a while, remember, Super Bowl week. First thing he said was, you're going to owe us an apology. And then, in a little bit of a shock to me, waved the white flag, backed off, said, I'm a league man at heart. i got to do what's best for the National Football League. So now Tom Brady's hanging out there alone. Doesn't have Belichick, doesn't have, obviously, Kraft. Belichick's not involved here because he's not in the line of fire, though I think he should be. So, again, does any of this surprise you? It doesn't surprise me in the least. Well, but, but it's not a matter of what surprises me, Skip. I think that I think it's important to think about how deep this goes. You know, Tom Brady uh, may be in the eye of the storm right now, but what I found fascinating upon having a bevy of phone calls, I may have had a particular source tell me about this angle of the story, but as you well know, I've known people within the Players Association and the National Football League for years. And so, you know, especially, you know, covering the uh, collective bargaining negotiations and all my years with, uh, you know, covering the NBA and having numerous people teach me about that, uh, just collective bargaining negotiations, period. Uh, you know, Charlie Grantham, the former executive director for the NBA Players Association, foremost amongst them. Uh, you know, you pay attention to what transpires during negotiations and how those things pan out. I bring that up to point out Robert Kraft's position here. You have to remember, you got on Robert Kraft for sort of caving in mm -hmm. and somewhat throwing Tom Brady under the bus. Yep. You have to remember that when you are an owner and you buy into the league and you become, yes, you may be competitors in terms of on the field play. But at the business table, you're actually partners. It's not the same as it is in corporate America. It's entirely different in the world of sports. You're competitors on the field, but partners at the negotiating table. And when you look at it from that perspective, you have to understand that Robert Kraft was under pressure to, rem to, to make sure he told the line in terms of being on the side of the league because sure. it's all about what's in the best interest of the league. And so if you're Robert Kraft, and there's something that transpired with Spygate, and there's some residue from that that, that could detrimentally that could that that could potentially devastate your franchise because it could get your coach Bill Belichick out of here if he's found to be implicated in any way. It's not just about the Tom Brady four game suspension. It was about something that reached further and wider as it pertained to Bill Belichick and the whole Patriots organization. And it was incumbent upon him to come to the rescue of the organization from what I'm being told. And that's what that's where the owners were really, really pressing him to think about the best interest of the league. As it pertains to Tom Brady, 
a legitimate argument could be made they're not involved in this at all. That Bashadi, the owner for the Baltimore Ravens, is absolutely right where he says, we didn't get involved in that stuff with Tom Brady. We didn't pay any attention to that. I guarantee you, you wouldn't hear the owners say that about how involved they were when it pertained to Robert Kraft accepting whatever penalty Roger Goodell threw in his direction. I guarantee you they didn't say that to him then because that's about the league. That's about the owners. That's about the sanctity and the integrity mm -hmm. of the shield. Tom Brady's just one player. And I don't think and, and, and I don't think that you're correct when you talk about how the owners are really pressing Roger Goodell to toe the line on this. I don't think they have to. Roger Goodell knows that for himself. The Patriots were the bigger issue. Tom Brady is just another you know, he's a player, it's a PR thing. But it's something that they can easily overcome because we're going to watch the games weeks one through four on Sunday afternoon, whether Tom Brady's playing or not. Yeah, but he's the player. Wouldn't you agree? He's the Super Bowl MVP. He's the golden well, boy New England Patriots for Super Bowl ring quarterback. Well, well, Skip Bayless, here's where you're wrong about that. You're not wrong about him being the player, but you are wrong because of your timing. Your argument holds tremendous weight in the two weeks leading up to the Super Bowl because from what I'm told, that's one of the reasons why they had such a problem with Tom Brady. Whether it's him refusing to show emails and text messages, his agent refusing to show emails and text messages, or his cell phone being destroyed, which is one of the things I'm hearing. I don't know because I don't know. I'm telling you what I heard. But at the end of the day, you have to understand that Tom Brady, all of that stuff is plausible if Tom Brady is being questioned leading up to the Super Bowl because at mm -hmm. that moment, he's concerned about them pulling him from playing in the Super Bowl. Now, now that that's over, they can lollygag and take their time. We're talking about the NFL. They mm -hmm. still get their publicity because whether it's basketball season or, the, or baseball or the baseball all-star week or whatever the case may be, you're still finding yourself talking about football. Bad publicity, good publicity, publicity for the NFL. They ain't phased by this Tom Brady stuff. They would have been leading into the Super Bowl. This time of year, please, they ain't concerned about that. Okay, now back to your statement. You said you got this from a source, not from you, but, but your source indicated to you that Brady and company will go to court at their own peril. Where is that yes. cell phone that they... That well, Tom well, Brady threw in the river as if it were a murder weapon, or that's kind of how the, the that's the tone you were using. You know, he destroyed well, the cell phone. Okay. Well, let me let me let, okay, let me well, let, I, for clear. All right, go ahead. Go just ahead. for right. just for clarification purposes for you, the source, the only thing that I spoke to my source about was the um, that, that the suspension would be upheld. Okay. Then I got on the phone and called some other people, and then they gave me all the background about what okay, Tom Brady supposedly has done, what they believe he has done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where they are. They're looking forward to him going to court because they believe that that will force him and others to give sworn testimony under oath mm -hmm. where they can't lie, otherwise they'll get in trouble. And that may be a way for them to delve further okay. into the Patriots organization. And remember, Roger Goodell or Ted Wells can't lie under oath in court either, right? So I'm here to tell you that I believe the NFL will enter into a court battle with Tom Brady at its own peril. Do you, do oh. you know? Do you know who Jeffrey Kessler is? I, I brought him up. Yes, to, I know okay, Jeffrey. Right I know a box. lot about Jeffrey Kessler. Okay, the first day that I heard that Tom Brady, this is day two after the Wells report hit the newsstand, so to speak, I told you that I was hearing that his first hire for his legal team was Jeffrey Kessler. He's not just mm -hmm. some sports lawyer. This is one of the finest litigators in the land. Do you remember that Freeman McNeil case back in 1992? Jeffrey right. Kessler represented Freeman McNeil against the National Football League and basically mm -hmm. won that case and established free agency in the NFL. He's 61 years of age. He's been doing this a long time. He knows where the bodies are buried in the National Football League. He's been a thorn in its side for years and years. Right. He's been very successful. And he is representing Tom Brady, not just Tom's agent or sports lawyer. Jeffrey mm -hmm. Kessler is on mm -hmm. the attack here and advising Tom Brady. I don't think he's getting bad advice to go uh, to court. I think he's getting great advice. Well, best. Skip Bayless, here's my, here's, here's, here's my problem with your position, and this is why I adamantly disagree with you. I think Jeffrey Kessler is an exceptional lawyer. 
I am not here to impugn his reputation or integrity. I respect the man based on what I know about him. He can be exceptional. My problem with you is that you act like Tom Brady has been convicted of a crime and the issue at hand is whether or not he's going to serve time in jail. That's not the issue. The issue is we're talking about deflated footballs, how truthful he was, mm. and as a result, whether he's going to serve a four-game suspension or not. And what I am telling you is that in, to the NFL, we have to define what winning is because this is business. This is not the court of law. This is the court of business. And I think I personally believe, and I've been on the record saying this to you on many occasions, that my problem with the Players Association, I have no doubt that DeMora Smith has surrounded himself with exceptional lawyers. The problem is they're too busy lawyering up all the time, and they're not busy enough conducting business from time to time. You've got to play the game according to the rules. And the rules with labor negotiations, collective bargaining, the power of Roger Goodell, the National Football League is entirely different than that other stuff. In the end, what winning is to Roger Goodell in the NFL in this case is Tom Brady missing the four games. You can appeal, say you can file an injunction, and then after it can be heard, and then ultimately it can be overturned, and all of this other stuff. If the NFL finds out that the court has ruled to support Tom Brady after he served those four games, in their eyes, they won. You, we're making sure you miss those four games. That's all they care about. They care about whatever ruling they come down with being upheld. No. Whether it's Ray Rice, whether okay. it's Adrian Peterson, Greg Hardy last season on a commissioner's no. exempt list or whatever. Whatever it takes, you're missing games. That to them is winning. You are missing the point. No, Tom Brady isn't liable to go to jail here. But maybe the greatest reputation in the history of the NFL, if in fact Tom Brady goes down as the greatest quarterback ever, the greatest okay. reputation hangs in the balance. It has already been tarnished and tainted. We both agree. Maybe yeah. indelibly by this. It, it just depends. Yeah. But if, if we Tom agree Brady too. could go to court and beat the NFL and get all four games removed and pay no fine and walk away a quote-unquote free man, again, we're not talking about going to jail here, we're just talking about a legacy, the all-time maybe greatest legacy that, that he wants to win back in large part by going to court. So this is huge to him. No, it's not. It, it's to, I'm sure in his mind it's tantamount to going to jail because it's, it's the rest of his life he's going to have to live with this taint, this tarnish, unless he gets it removed to some degree in court. And I'm saying to you, in order to get it removed, you ha not only have to prove that the league is wrong about deflated footballs and your specific role is it in, in, involved in that, you also have to prove that the league is wrong by saying you were uncooperative. And being uncooperative is so subject to interpretation. You got that it's right. It's almost impossible. Not, not only that, it's mm -hmm. also, you also have to keep in mind, Skip, this is the commissioner having the power bestowed upon him, not just by the 32 owners, but in a collective bargaining negotiation where he wasn't stripped of that power yep. by the Players Association. Yep. I can give you, I can get, we can sit here all day and I can give you one case after another, after another, assuming I knew them by heart, where the courts ultimately threw it right back to the parties because they don't try to get themselves yep. that intimately involved in collective bargaining because they're not going to overrule what was collectively bargained. Okay. If it was collectively bargained, that's the power that Roger Goodell has. You're okay. at the mercy of his discretion. Remember, I they didn't understand. even want him to hear the appeal, and he still heard the appeal. I told you yesterday how foolish the NFL already looks and how their case, I think, will be weakened in court because they just finally instituted these new rules to monitor and govern the handling of the quarterback footballs up to kickoff. Are you kidding me? In 2015, this is the first time you institute. They look so silly here. Skip. This is such advantage Brady in court. The judge is going to say, wait, you, you didn't really have any protocol in place to govern the footballs, and now you're, you're trying to dock this, this quarterback four games for what exactly? Come on Skip, now. You, 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 that, that, that may be correct, but you're giving me emotion. I'm giving you fact. The fact is Roger Goodell 
had the power to do it. And at the end of the day, it seems anyway, if you know, based on what I'm hearing in the next 24 to 48 hours, they are going to confirm that they are standing by their ruling and that Tom okay. Brady is going to serve Fine. four games come hell or high right. water. OK, so I'm, I got one more emotional outburst here, if I'm allowed. I sure. still believe that at heart. This is in part about this commissioner, so under fire, so on the hot seat post Ray Rice and, and all that he did not do prior to, to the Ray Rice situation. And now he's trying to win back some authority, some credibility, some sovereignty as the commissioner. He's trying to reflex some muscles by taking on the Super Bowl MVP. Take him down four games, and I'm back in charge, Roger Goodell. The man, That's what I the think. Man is get, the man is getting 35 to 45 million dollars a year. He's not an elected official. He answers to 32 owners. What are you talking about? Pressure. This man is chilling. Roger Goodell ain't losing no sleep over this. Well, for a while, a lot of people thought he should lose his job over the but mishandling of Ray Rice. But he did it because the owners said no. Period. Okay, just to recap, in case anyone's just joining us, Stephen A. Smith heard this morning that Tom Brady's suspension will be upheld the four games. If that's so, he will return week six. Likely. Likely. If that, if that happens, he will return week six against the Colts Sunday night football, that due to the bye. Russell Wilson has won 42 games, including the postseason, the most combined wins in a quarterback's first three seasons. During that span, he's been pretty much a steal for Seattle making less than $3 million since coming into the league as a third-round pick. In 2015, 40 quarterbacks in the NFL are making more money than him. Wilson is looking for a new contract, asking for $25 million a year. Now, if the Seahawks don't reach a contract extension by the opening day of training camp Friday, he's likely to play out the season for just over $1.5 million and await the likelihood of getting a franchise tag next February, as John Clayton reported. Skip. My question to you is, how much is Russell Wilson worth? Molly, Stephen A., I find this young man very difficult to rank in terms of worth because he is such a rare and unique entity in the National Football League. I've never seen anything quite like Russell Wilson. In fact, I'll go this far. He is already what I had hoped Johnny Manziel would turn into in the National Football League until his off-field issues, including alcohol, took him down. So, is Russell Wilson worth the $25 million that he and his team asked for? His legal team, obviously. No. He, he's not worth the most quarterback money in the National Football League beyond Aaron Rodgers. Is he worth right around that $21 million a year that reportedly has been offered him by the Seattle Seahawks? Yes, I, I think he is, Stephen A. And my two cents worth of advice to Russell Wilson, I, I hope he goes ahead and takes that deal if, in fact, that's about what he's been offered because I think that's who he is. Now, let's, let's look at him for a second. How do we usually rank NFL quarterbacks? We start with their ability to pocket pass. Russell Wilson is a below-average pocket passer. So that's not advantage Russell there. Big advantage Russell is, his defense over the last three years has allowed 155 points fewer than any other National Football League defense. Big advantage Russell there. And by the way, his running back, Beast Mode, Marshawn Lynch, has been over the last three years the NFL's leading rusher with 4,153 yards. Wow. 36 touchdowns has Beast Mode scored over the last three years. That leads the National Football League. And in carries, he has 20 more carries over the last three years, Russell's three years, than any other running back. That's a big advantage, Russell Wilson. Now, I look at what has Russell done. Well, obviously, he's got to, gotten to back-to-back -back Super Bowls, which is pretty great. Almost won two in a row. I thought he threw a ball that could have been caught to win the second one, this last one. His touchdowns and interceptions are 72 to 26, which is pretty great. His QBR last year was eighth in the league, which is pretty good. And his regular season record is 36 and 12. I throw in his rushing yards, which over the last three years have been number one among quarterbacks, just barely above Cam's. Boy, that's, that's pretty great. 
because the quickness, the foot speed, combined with the playmaking ability and the clutch factor, he's got the big clutch gene, that makes him pretty special. Can I say that he's better than, uh, I'll, in a vacuum, is he better than Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers? No. Better than Peyton, Romo, Roethlisberger, Breeze, Luck? No. Sorry. So I just went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven deep, and I can't go there with Russell Wilson. But I could make him eight. So, and again, he had the eighth best QBR last year. And, and in today's world, with those victories that he has, I, I would pay him $21 million a year, which is pretty great for a third-round draft pick. Well, first of all, it's more than Jay Cutler in yeah. uh, and, and average, I believe. So that's that's my priority right there because Jay Cutler doesn't deserve to be in the same ballpark as any of those. Dudes. That's fair. Having said having said all of that, Aaron Rodgers is only at 22 million in terms of his average. Ben Roethlisberger is at 21.8. Cam Newton's now at 20. Um, Drew Brees is at 20. Um, I look at it from this perspective: Russell Wilson is not worth 25 million a year because you know that you are a product of the Legion of Boom and their dominance on the defensive side of the ball. That assists the Seattle Seahawks in being who they are. Russell Wilson deserves money. Russell Wilson deserves to get paid about 20 to 21 million a year in average, Skip. I totally agree with you there. I also think he should get anywhere from 55 to 60 million because I'm disgusted that Tony Romo is at 55 million and by the way making new commercials and the man has done nothing but won two playoff games in his entire career. Okay, never been to a conference championship game, never been to a Super Bowl, certainly hasn't won one obviously. So because of that and you've got all of that going on in his favor, I definitely think Russell Wilson can make a legitimate argument as it pertains to his market value because at this juncture, he's proven to be a winner, not to mention the fact that he's only 26 years of age. He's athletic, he's strong, he's got a motor, he's got a deceptively strong arm, he's a playmaker. I like Russell Wilson a lot, but you can't give him $25 million a year because something like that implies that you're the best in the game and you're not it's just that simple the green bay packers are in you know they they're you know they're done they're outside of the playoffs looking in without aaron Rodgers. okay to some degree you could say that about tony romo you could definitely say that about peyton manning you could say that about drew Brees. you can't say that about russell wilson it's entirely possible that a very average quarterback with Marshawn Lynch behind him, with guys like Jimmy Graham and others to throw the ball to, and Doug Baldwin and those cursing those guys to throw the ball to, a decent offensive line with that defense, it's a legitimate argument that the Seattle Seahawks could be a playoff team without Russell Wilson. So I really hope that he takes this deal, appreciates the fact that he's being recognized for his potential and for the results he's already produced. But at the same time, $25 million implies you're the best in the game. And Russell Wilson knows there's no way in hell that he is. He just lost a Super Bowl. You could hear him hugging Tom Brady and saying, you're the greatest. So that's one guy you obviously know is better than you. We all know Aaron Rodgers is better than him. And so when you look at it from that perspective, it's like pump the brakes a little bit. Take this 20 to 21 million. Make sure you get a minimum of 55 million in guarantee since that's what Tony Romo's getting and Jay Cutler's in that vicinity. I'd say go up as high as 60 to 61 million in guarantees and call it a day. That's what I would do if I'm Russell Wilson. Okay, but for you to go so far as to say Russell Wilson is a product of the Legion of Boom is, is slightly, yeah. that's a little disrespectful to me. I think he's better than just so. a product. That, that would indicate well, well, that, that he's a dime a dozen, you know, like you could. No, I, I, well, then, well then you're right because I certainly don't mean to imply that. I'm simply saying without the Legion of Boom, Russell Wilson would not have had the success that he had. The fact that he's able to go to the table and even ask for this money is a product of him going to two straight Super Bowls. That does not happen if the Legion of Boom is not your defense. It doesn't happen. Russell Wilson's not that kind of player. He can make plays for you. He can respond in the clutch for you. I think he's one of the top 12 to 15 players in the NFL based on his versatility, what he brings to the table combined with his production. But in terms of his overall talent, I just look at him and I say he's above average. He's very good. But it's not greatness there yet, not without the Legion of Boom. And, and, and to me, that's where that $25 million 
gets excessive. If you can give Cutler and, and Tony Romo, and, and, and even though Flacco's a Super Bowl champion, to a lesser degree, Flacco, the money that you're getting, Russell Wilson demands that. He commands that. But $25 million, as you're yep. saying, you're better than everybody else. And you're not. Okay. And He's I not. cannot let you get away with the gratuitous shot you took at Tony Romo, who, by Why the way, had, had a great year last year, should have been the regular season MVP. And I don't want to dredge up all the numbers, but over the last three years, his fourth quarter clutch numbers are at near the top of the National Football League. You know what? You know what? You're beginning to get on my damn nerves, well, Skip Bayless. You're why don't you, why don't you sit there? I'm not that good. Well, good, Skip Bayless, because yeah. I'm, I'm, I've had it up to here with you. I've had, Turn off the damn video of Tony Romo. I don't want to see it I right now. I'm Romo talking to Skip Bayless. Let me tell you something. You're getting on my nerves with this. Yeah. You so wait, wait Make up your mind. Okay. Does I'm winning matter? Up. Does winning matter or yeah. does stats matter? Because if winning matters, Tony Romo hasn't done it. I'm disgusted he when I saw that commercial of him last night. Including the one in Green Bay. The, what two playoff games? He won he in won Green Bay. He made the throw that won the game. Oh, it. It. It, was it was a catch. It was a catch. It was a catch. Well, then who played in the NFC Championship game? Who I can't help it. He got robbed. Oh, Wait a please. second. He got robbed. robbed. He lost. Here's the oh, point. Please. You took Stop a shot it. at Romo. Stop it. He's making all these commercials. Care. He deserves it. Wait a second. He deserves He's it. Making He's making one. Time out. He just made a direct TV commercial, as did... Who's that guy in New York, that Eli guy? Oh. When was the He's got two Super Bowl rings. I believe He's in Eli. He's got two Super Bowl rings. Wait, when was the last time two. he was even in the playoffs? He's got two. When was He's he last two in rings. the playoffs? What have you done for me He's lately, Eli? He's got two Eli? rings. What's it been, three He's got years two since rings. he was even in the playoffs and he gets a direct he, TV commercial? Listen, and by listen, the way. The only time Tony Romo has been to a Super Bowl is when he showed up as a visitor. And oh, I don't even know if he's done that. Yeah. He's never played in one. He's never played in a conference championship game. ever. And by the way, oh, Eli, please. Eli's I mean, direct TV on my nerves with this. I mean, the plays. Did you see it. it? Have you seen Eli's direct TV commercial? His, no, his, and I don't need to. His alter ego yeah. is more entertaining than the real Eli. Oh. I wish he were always the alter ego Stop guy. Fired. It would be funny. He's got two rings. He would rings. be entertaining. Come on. He's got two rings. By the way, two. Andrew Luck got Tony a direct Romo. TV commercial where he's nine years looking at his nine and years. I don't know what he's doing. Nine he's years. Three and three in the playoffs. You should be Andrew ashamed Luck. of yourself. Really? You wow. should be ashamed of yourself. Yeah. Two playoff victories in nine years. Yeah. Two playoff victories in nine years. Yeah. What about last year? Are you, you're just embarrassing yourself. I'm so sick and tired of Tony Romo. Hey, Cowards, just, just stop it. He stop deserves it. his money. First. All right, all right, all right. Let's settle down. Let me get this straight. Skip Bayless likes Tony Romo. Mental note. I think I'm starting, yeah. starting to get. You know what? Starting to get that. I'm glad you job. deduced that. Okay. I finally got that. Uh, point I'm, across. I'm glad I picked up on that. But I do want to recap. You guys both agree that Russell Wilson needs to be compensated 25 million, a little steep. But I have a silver lining for you, Skip Bayless. I need one. In the meantime, while yes. he's making 1.5, mm -hmm. at least he has Sierra to help out with the bills. Oh. Power couple, oh. right? Really? Yes. You really mean I, that? I went there. Really? Yes. I, I'm sorry. I, listen, Sierra, I am a fan. Yes. In so many ways, I, I am, am a as fan. well. But 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 she's no Beyonce. Okay. And I'm talking monetarily. I'm not talking monetarily. Not some change though. But no Beyonce. Well, we don't know that. I don't know. All right. I don't know. All right. Well, we'll get research on that. And no one is Beyonce. You're right. Queen B, another level. Geico presents Strange Saving Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. The family of the late Junior Seau will not speak at the Hall of Fame ceremonies on August 8th, according to a policy put in place in 2010 by the Pro Football Hall of Fame regarding individuals honored after their death. This decision didn't go over well with the Seau family. A statement from them. The Seau family appreciates the overwhelming support for Sydney Seau to be able to accept Junior's induction into the Hall of Fame live and in her own words. Unfortunately, the Hall of Fame is unwilling to reserve its decision despite communicating to the family earlier this year that Sydney would be able to speak at the ceremony. Contrary to the most recent statement by the Hall of Fame, the family does not support the current policy that prevents family members from delivering live remarks on behalf of deceased inductees. 
Oh, actually, Stephen, uh, sorry, a, Stephen a, let's a, start a, with oh, you. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your reaction to uh, his daughter's comments there, Sydney, in the family? I think the Hall of Fame should be ashamed of itself. That's my reaction to it. Um, I do understand that people can go up there and be a bit long-winded. And obviously, it's a day to celebrate the athletes themselves, not necessarily their family. Uh, but if you take into account and attach any legitimacy to former players and some of the things that they've been complaining about in terms of concussions and the whole CTE issue, then one would surmise, at the very least, that it's possible that that had everything to do with Junior Seau's death because his family is certainly claiming as much. When you consider that and the fact that it was her father's dying wish to have her, his daughter Sydney, introduce him at the Hall of Fame, assuming he was alive if it ever happened or if he passed away, he obviously wanted her to honor him along with the Hall of Fame posthumously. The fact that they can't see fit to reverse their policy to me is egregious and it's really unfortunate that they're that insensitive and they're coming across that way. You can make a concession, number one. Number two and more importantly, what you can do is simply attach a time limit. Meet him in the middle. Of course you don't want her up there talking about their lawsuit against the National Football League on behalf of Junior Seau. You don't want the NFL attacked. You certainly want the Hall of Fame to be about the greatness on the field for these players, honoring them, the sacrifices that they made to the game, etc. So you can certainly sort of edit and, and, and censor some of the remarks to, to a degree. You can do that. And in the same breath, you can turn around and say, OK, you have 10 minutes max to give your speech and be done with it. And nobody would be upset about that. Everyone would understand it. And, and I, I just think that it's the right thing to do. I know that the Hall of Fame gives a video tribute and it's going to potentially include family members as it has in the past and all of that other stuff. But the family is on the record. Junior Seau wanted his daughter to introduce him, you know, into the Hall of Fame or give a speech on his behalf. The family acknowledges that. Sydney acknowledges that. And considering what he did for the NFL, what he meant to the game, what so many of these individuals, some deceased, some still alive, have done for the game, to me, to not grant this wish is just the latest in a long line of crumbs displaying the lack of respect accorded to these former great players. And it's really a shame because Jim, Junior mm -hmm. Seau deserves better than this. I'm with you on your conclusion. If I ran this Hall of Fame, I would have found some compromise exception to this rule just because of this circumstance. Right. And I would have figured out a way, even though, remember, just for the record, Stephen A., there will be a, a taped piece on Junior's greatness in his career yeah, the video and, and yeah, the video that. will run I know and and Sydney the daughter can speak in the video now could that get edited I have no idea about who has editorial control over that video but it will be shown I assume she will speak obviously she will be allowed to speak to all the media that gathers at these big events at th this pro football Hall of Fame induction ceremony and obviously she she deserves the right to speak, and if she chooses, to speak out. So I'm with you in spirit here. Now, I'm trying to see both sides. Let's just take only the Hall of Fame side, not the NFL side, and, and both continue to insist we're not linked together. The NFL says it right. doesn't control the Hall of Fame, and the Hall of Fame says it's not controlled by the NFL. Is that true? I don't know. I honestly do not know, but that's what they say. So if we step back and, and we look at the Hall of Fame by in and of itself, its very purpose is to glorify the great players who played this great game of football, right? So on this night, the, the, the sole motivation on the part of the Hall of Fame is to have a feel-good, very warm and fuzzy ceremony honoring, as we know, Jerome Bettis and Tim Brown, Charles Haley, uh, obviously our own Bill Polian, the great Ron, Ron Wolf, we can go on and on. 
It would be a great celebration of the sport of football. And I'm sure some of the hall officials were a little squeamish about, gee, because remember, the family has filed a pending wrongful death suit against the National Football League, which they certainly have a right to do. He died, according to several doctors from CTE, did Junior Seau. So I get that, but, but if you're a Hall of Fame official, would you dread that moment? Could it be sort of a killjoy moment, like wrong place, wrong time, in the flow yeah. of, of the, the, the celebration that is this great uh, long night? Of course you dread that mm -hmm. moment, if it occurred. But Junior Seau, throughout his exceptional career, has earned the right I'm with you on that. for you to I, take, I you to take a chance to be and here. allow them. I'm, okay. I'm just saying that I'm you don't you. know. It's not like it's not like she said, this is what I'm going to do. A matter of fact, she's on the record saying, I have no intentions of doing that. I just want to celebrate my father. Yep. She has a right to do that. And the people in those stands and the people behind her mm -hmm. who are Hall of Famers, they will much rather see somebody speaking than a video tribute, in my opinion. Okay, now let's go one level deeper here. Is it possible the NFL fears a parade of family members of CTE victims marching up to an open mic at Hall of Fame ceremonies to come as they are honored posthumously, you know, admitted as, as a deceased player? Does the NFL want to quell that, stop that with this rule? That's highly um, possible, but I don't know that. But I throw out that possibility. I guess it's possible. What I would say in response to that, Skip, is that, you know, family members of CTE victims, if I were them, I would descend upon every Hall of Fame if you didn't allow us to speak. Okay. That's my whole point. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make that a part of my Hall of Fame speech. Right. But I would make it a point to be heard. If you made a concerted effort to prevent us from being heard, okay. if you understand what I'm saying. Okay. So now I ask you one final question. If you're a Hall of Fame official and you do make an exception for Sidney Seau, you do crack open the Pandora's box of, okay, you made an exception for them. What about the next deceased player's family? And they'll say, well, gee, you, you let her. Well, how is our situation that different from hers? And you say, well, I am in no way. I am in no way implying that an exception should be made for her because she's Junior Seau's daughter. I'm saying the same exception for her should be granted to any Oh, Hall so you of say Famer. do away with the rule. With, I'm saying do away. Just make the exception of, look, this is the Hall of Fame. This is, we don't want you using this platform to touch on that subject. And we're going to limit the speech to 10 minutes. I'm saying those two caveats should be more than enough for her to go up there and give her speech and be heard on behalf of her father. And okay. I think I'm any family you. member of a, of, a, of a Hall of Famer who's deceased should be allowed the same courtesy. Okay, last quick point, just being realistic here. If you allow a family member the open mic, it's hard to get them off after 10 minutes. How are you going to do it? Have the orchestra play like they do at the Academy Awards? You can't if, if do that's it. what it takes. You can't go up there and, that's, yeah, and pull yeah, them off yeah. stage. They, they need to bring somebody like Stephen A. up there. I'll show them how to do would it. Would you? It's very oh, easy. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. I would do it. Oh, yeah. No, oh, yeah. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. You, up, you, up on stage. Yeah. You, you, up, you up on stage. And you talk and you talk and smack like it. I don't want to say smack because I don't mean it disrespectfully. No, I got you. No, but if you get if you're getting a bit excessive, yeah. if you're getting a bit excessive in your speech and you're 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 not paying attention to the time restrictions, oh, I'll make you do that. He'll easily. put the smack down. He can okay. control things. Since Thank Stephen you for a. offering yes. that, Stephen A. He, he needs to MC no the problem. ceremony. We appreciate you no problem. Um, offering your services. Meanwhile, the NFL and NFLPA are in talks regarding a possible settlement over Tom Brady's four-game suspension for his role in the Deflategate scandal. Sources tell ESPN and Fox Sports, which first reported the sides had started talking. Stephen A. talked to some people this morning, and his sources are telling him the suspension will likely be upheld. Our NFL analyst, Mark Burnell, joins us now. We'll get your take in just a second. But Stephen A., can you please recap quickly what you heard and your reaction to all of this? Not a problem, Mark. Uh, I was told about an uh, hour or so before the show that it's likely that within the next 24 to 48 hours, the NFL will announce that they're upholding uh, the four-game suspension. As you well know, 
uh, Tom Brady on the appeal, with the appeals process in front of Roger Goodell on June 23rd. We've been awaiting a decision. Uh, the NFL will announce that they're going to uphold the four games in all likelihood, barring some last minute, uh, you know, whatever, some last minute negotiation, or whatever the case may be. I'm told that they really weren't interested in that when the NFL Players Association presented it to them. We all read that they were very, very silent and then they responded. But there's really not going to be a settlement. They're going to hold their feet firm to the four game suspension. Their belief is that the rules apply to everybody. They're of the belief that Tom Brady broke those rules, uh, that he was uncooperative, not just in terms of refusing to show Ted Wells his text messages, emails, etc., or, or have his agent just show him those text messages and emails relevant to specifically Deflate Gate. But also, I'm hearing that you know their belief is that Tom Brady destroyed his cell phone, and so you co you couple all of that combined with the fact that Robert Kraft has already backed off at the behest of other league owners, and in the best interest of the league, and the Patriots are going to take their million dollar fine in their first and fourth round confiscation of draft picks. Uh, it's only Tom Brady to be dealt with, and they're of the belief that you know he he's, he's he either hasn't been totally honest. Uh, or he has definitely been uncooperative, and they're going to hold their feet firm to the four-game suspension, and they're going to look forward to him trying to take them to court because there he'll have to give sworn testimony, and they're looking forward to that as well. Well, if in fact that uh, Tom was uncooperative, and if in fact he did destroy his cell phone, I don't think this should come as any surprise. Um, the, the commissioner, you know going in, was going to have a show of strength, uh, he was probably going to uphold those those four games uh, going forward. He will continue to do so, but it really comes down to not being cooperative. If that is what the, the uh, Mr. Goodell and the NFL um, believe to be the case, then this should come as absolute no surprise. Would you allow me to reiterate your original position on sure. this? Because you were extremely adamant in your conviction that Tom Brady had to know about the deflation of the footballs, right? Can you restate your case? Absolutely. You know, the football uh, is our livelihood. The condition of the football for a quarterback is very important. And I have not met a quarterback in my 19-year NFL career, starting quarterback, that wasn't concerned about the preparation of the footballs, that didn't have a, uh, an involvement as far as what footballs he wanted to play with. And every preference is different. Um, me, I was a middle-of-the-road guy. I, I didn't want it too inflated, too deflated, we, but uh, I made sure I put my hand on every football before, before the games. That was important to me. Um, most quarterbacks would tell you the same thing. So for Tom uh, to say that he didn't have any involvement, it was, you know, that's not what he did, I find that really hard to believe. Um, and that is, has been the, uh, the viewpoint of a lot of former starting quarterbacks, great quarterbacks that understand full well mm -hmm. how this works. If I'm in a game, and I get that ball in my hand, and it is not to my liking. Well, that affects my accuracy. It affects my um, the the velocity of the football, you know, and and how far I can throw that football. So um, that that is just skip. Mm -hmm. Even if that's the way it works, that's your livelihood. You know very well how the condition of those footballs. Okay. Now let me restate what I was told by three sources close to Tom Brady two days after the Wells report broke. They were adamant to me that all Tom Brady ever told his ball boys or whatever you want to call those equipment people sure. was that I want my footballs inflated to the lower end of regulation, period, end of story. And that's exactly what he told Ted Wells and that he eventually, through the appeals process, told Roger Goodell. So quickly to Stephen A., this whole idea, he destroyed his cell phone, that, that's pretty damning. So. Uh, I don't know. Can, will that stand up in court that he destroyed his cell phone? Because that would be pretty incriminating. Well, I, again, I don't know. I'm only I'm only sharing with you what I've been told uh, as of nine o'clock this morning. It's what they said. It's what their suspicions were, if not still are, obviously, and that's the position that they're taking. I do know that they they plan on upholding the four game suspension, bar barring any last minute changes. I do know, and, and based on what I was told, actually, that <clears throat> when they decided to, Robert Kraft decided to accept the penalty, uh, I was I was of the mindset, you know, Bill Belichick was, you know, yeah, he's not paying attention to deflated footballs or whatever, and folks were like, no, he was involved in Spygate. And the fact is, is that 
if he is found uh, to if there are any if there's any incriminating evidence against Bill Belichick to be found and this matter had progressed further it would have been to the detriment of the New England Patriots because there's language within the whole Spygate ruling that stipulates that in the event that Bill Belichick is found to have been involved with any such behavior again he could face banishment from the league and that's obviously something that wasn't in the best interest of the of the of the league it certainly wasn't in the best interest of Robert Kraft and the New England Patriots which facilitated him ultimately accepting this deal now whether that's true or not you'd have to ask the NFL and again I want to emphasize Adam Schefter Chris Mortensen those guys cover the league as insiders for this network they know a hell of a lot more than I do as it pertains to the NFL but this is what I was told as of nine o'clock this morning one source told me about the imminent suspension to be upheld and then I got on the phone with several individuals within the with, within the hour before first take and they gave me the rest of that stuff about Bill Belichick about the Patriots about Robert Kraft about Tom Brady etc so mm -hmm. within the next 24 to 48 hours the NFL is like bring it on because it's going to be far more to your detriment Mm -hmm. then it will be to ours. Okay, and, and again, starting two days after the Wells report, <clears throat> those three sources told me then, and I said on this show, Tom Brady will take this to court to the death, the legal death, that that, that aw shucks guy that we see in interviews is going to turn into that psycho Tom that we <laughs> see on the field. You know that guy who goes a little nuts on oh, the sure. field? That's the guy who's going to go to court here. And this this is not knew this was from two days well it happened immediately as soon as the Wells report hit Tom Brady is saying I will take this to court and he didn't just say my sports agent's gonna represent me he went and got Jeffrey Kessler and you you know Jeffrey from all your days sure. player repping and all the things that you've done legally with the NFL uh, he's the best so Tom Brady knew from the start this was going to happen so am I surprised that Roger Goodell upheld the four games no because Brady's legal team is telling from the start Nope, we're going to court. We'll, we'll pay a fine. We'll pay a fine. But you have to reduce all four games to none or we're going to court. We won't accept well, Mark, the one game suspension. Mark, here's what I'm trying to get Skip to really, really stomach. Whatever bravado, whatever defiance, or whatever word is appropriate to describe Tom Brady's um, vehemence uh, in his own defense, it comes now. But at the time that he was originally being questioned, at least to a small degree, he was worried about missing the Super Bowl. And so what the NFL is contending is no matter what position he takes now, no matter how emboldened he appears, we're also piggybacking to the things that he may have said to us or we may be aware of that he said about the flake gate prior to the Super Bowl. And so the Tom Brady that you're seeing now, Skip, this is what I'm trying to say to him, Mark. Maybe entirely different than that Tom Brady that who wanted to make sure that come hella high water, he didn't do anything to position himself to potentially miss the Super Bowl. And that's where it gets interesting. Because even if he's totally innocent, he may have come across in an effort to be to, to look to cover for somebody else, if not himself, all in an effort to protect the interests of the New England Patriots going into the Super Bowl. Well, guess what? That still incriminates him because if that's what you did prior to the Super Bowl, they're not looking at it being prior to the Super Bowl. They're looking at it being the fact that they asked you a question. They came to you and presented themselves, asked you a question, and you still did not answer as truthfully or as cooperatively as you should have. And I, that's I, where they're at. Yeah, and, and when this all came out, you know, you remember Tom's press conference. He didn't sell it. We didn't see that competitive, fiery guy. There was no direct right. statement. He wasn't looking at the camera saying, I did not do this. The truth will come out. He didn't sell anything. He wasn't believable, Skip. And that's, that is cause for concern. And then you add the fact that he wasn't cooperative. Well, okay, but, but we're accepting Ted Wells' view that he wasn't cooperative. Are you going to take that to the bank? Can, can you take that to court? Will that stand up in court? That's one man's view of cooperation. Oh. Maybe Tom Brady will argue in court, I was completely cooperative. Like Stephen A., you're, you're, you keep expressing it as a fact that he wasn't cooperative. How do you know that for sure? Because Ted I, I, Wells no, wrote it? No, no, but no, Skip, you're being emotional, so you're interpreting me and conveying it as fact. I'm conveying it as the NFL interpreting it as such. 
if they're the boss and they deem you uncooperative, then damn it, they deem you uncooperative. That's what they're saying. That's what I don't I wasn't there. I don't know. But I know that's what they're saying. And, and, and Skip, this one other nugget of information that I think you need to know. If I re- double check this, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I'm almost I'm, I'm almost there. I think that day of the AFC championship game, if I remember correctly, Troy Vincent was in attendance. He was there. And when that stuff happened with the Colts at halftime, he was one of the guys with NFL security so, escorting them so wait, to the, to, off the field. So he botched it at halftime because there were two gauges used, and Walt Coleman couldn't remember whether he used I guess this so. gauge well, in that well, gauge. Well, really? I guess so. I guess oh, so. But I'm saying, to, I'm saying to you, once again, once again, you twisted it. I'm just giving you the info. <laughs> I'm saying to you, I'm if you're the executive VP, wait a minute. If you're the executive VP of the NFL and you play a role in the ruling and you were there, if indeed, if indeed he was there, then that means he was around communicating with some of those guys once this whole thing unfolded, which would put him in a position to validate whatever ruling he decided to reach. Because remember, Roger Goodell leaned on him, too. So I'm just saying that if he if indeed he was there and he had to talk to the equipment manager or for some reason, even if the whatever communication he may have had with the New England Patriots in whatever capacity, it does resonate. If the executive VP of the NFL, who's the one that was handed down the ruling, was in attendance, doesn't that does that make sense, Mark? I mean, I think it does. He was there. Well, it was interesting to me that in the Wells report, there was one gauge that deemed some of the Patriot footballs even inflated above regulation. So I, I don't know. I don't but know. Skip, they, I, but, but they never we're, said we're, we're Ted, Wells, courts. <laughs> Ted Wells said more probable than not. He never said definitively. And you could say that's just link that, that, that mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's just lingo, collective bargaining lingo or whatever. But in the end, what they're leaning on is they're saying Tom Brady was uncooperative and we will not tolerate it. They're not going where you're going. They're just saying, you know what? You were uncooperative. That's where they're bringing the hammer down. How are you going to refute that? By testimony. You say I wasn't uncooperative. I I said I didn't do it. I don't know what he'll say, but I'm sure it'll be good. Johnny Manziel begins training camp as the Cleveland Browns backup. But Coach Mike Penton said Manziel can still win the job with his performance. Penton did say it's still likely that Josh McCown will be the Browns' opening day starter against the Jets September 13th. Mark Brunell is kind enough to stay with us. Mark, your thoughts on this. Can Johnny Manziel really win the starting job here? I don't believe he can. Josh McCown is there for a reason. He is a solid reliable veteran who's been around the league for a long time and he's had flashes of very good football seasons two years ago with the chicago bears he was brilliant so the browns obviously are hoping that he can return to that form quarterbacks you have to be able to trust your quarterback and that's the most important thing a head coach wants is will he take care of the football josh mccown is a quarterback that will take care of the football is he going to go win you a bunch of games Probably not, but he's not going to lose a lot of games, too. Johnny Manziel is the complete opposite end of the spectrum. He's an unknown right now. Last year, he struggled on and off the field. He still has to learn what it means to be a professional. Now, in the OTAs, in in the summer workouts, if Josh McCown just completely struggled, if Johnny Manziel just absolutely lit it up and really developed as a passer, as a person, as a quarterback, then maybe. But that did not happen this spring for the Browns. And so I'm surprised to hear this from Coach Petten, um, understanding full well what it takes going into a season. Uh, you need a quarterback, like I said, that you can trust. And Johnny, you just can't trust him yet. He's still very young. Will he be down the road, the, the guy for the Cleveland Browns? Maybe. We don't know. But from what we saw last year, and having just one, mm-hmm. one o, you know, session of OTAs, he had a long way to go. He still has a long way to go. Josh McCown is going to be the starter. Yeah, he has 12 years of experience mm-hmm. in the league. Stephen, now your thoughts. Well, listen, I, 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 I'm of the mindset that Johnny Manziel has a chance because I think they want him to have a chance. He's a, he's a first-round pick, and 
obviously, if it doesn't pan out, it's already been disastrous simply due to his performance and then obviously his issues uh, with, with, with substance abuse and having to go into rehab. Now that that hopefully is behind him, you know, you got to hope that he can give you something. So I think that that was just Petten's way of saying, we're going to do everything we can to give him an opportunity. And I do believe that despite the friction that existed, you got a lot of people that are supportive of Johnny Manziel. Skip, I was in Cleveland during the NBA Finals, obviously, and I saw Johnny Manziel on several occasions. Uh, while I saw him, I saw a lot of his teammates with him. Um, they're incredibly supportive of him. You got a lot of guys rooting for him. Obviously, I didn't see any members of their coaching staff because that's a different scenario altogether. Uh, but the owner uh, wanted him. At least one executive there wanted him. And then when you take into account that the players are rooting for him and McCown is an individual who's a leader that doesn't mind sort of setting the stage for the heir apparent per se, uh, they talked a lot about how Johnny Manziel wasn't provided any guidance whatsoever last year, not just due to the fact that the Cleveland Browns were a dysfunctional organization from the top on down, but also because you had a guy in Hoyer who wasn't interested in giving up his job, who wasn't interested in helping you. Um, he wasn't rude or abrasive or anything like that. But Johnny Manziel was clearly on his own because Hoyer, who's a local product at the time being in Cleveland as a starting quarterback, was, wasn't trying to give up his job. Whereas McCown, he has no problem with it. He knows he's there to sort of set the stage for you to take over. And I think he's going to do everything that he can to help Johnny Manziel prosper. And I think that assistance gives Johnny Manziel a chance. Mark is probably right in terms of Johnny, whether or not Johnny Manziel will be ready, but I think that McCown is going to assist in, in, in helping him get the chance to pull it off because he's not there to compete with him. He's here to help guide and tutor him to elevate mm. him to that spot. Well, your operative word there that I loved, and I'm going to reuse here back to Mark, is prosper. I hope one day in Cleveland, Johnny Manziel can prosper at quarterback. I think that's a long shot right now. I'm rooting for the kid. I like the heck out of the kid. I know him a little bit. I know him pretty well. Loved him as a college player. Never loved his off-field behavior, but thought it was part and parcel of sort of who he was on the football field. But it finally just ate him up. And obviously, I said on the show even before the draft, if alcohol becomes an issue, I'm out. Right. And it became an issue. And he went to rehab. And as I've said many times, I watched my mom go through rehab. And it changed her dramatically. If, if it takes, if, if you let it take over your soul and change who you are, because you have to change to beat this demon of the alcohol abuse, in my mom's case, then... Maybe you'll lose a little spark. Maybe you'll be a little different coming out. So, is, again, Johnny's already said, I don't want to be Johnny football anymore. But did he lose some of that Johnny football on the field, too? Boxing. Yeah, that, whatever that thing is, yeah. that it, that it factor. factor. That, yeah, it is it or X mm -hmm. that made him Johnny Manziel, made him Johnny football. I don't know if it's there anymore. So, do I think that, that Mike Patton has been pleasantly surprised about Johnny's rededication to becoming, as you say, a pro football player? You better believe it, because I, from what I'm hearing, Johnny has rededicated, not rededicated, dedicated for the first time to actually studying the playbook, arriving early, staying late, extra reps. As Stephen A. said, those, those players have really come around. Some of them were already in his corner, but I think that whole team is coming around. They're seeing a kid who's trying to learn how to do it at this level, which obviously is very, as you well know, is extremely different from the college football level. And Johnny took a, an emotional beating last year. He was humiliated by his performance in the preseason and in a few regular season games. So now he's trying to work his way through that. This is my bottom line gut feeling. I believe the Cleveland Browns have lost too much confidence in Johnny Manziel. Who, who may have lost too much of his own confidence. I believe that Mike Patton in saying, yeah, he's got a shot at winning our starting job. I believe he's trying to rehype a little trade value. I believe they will dangle Johnny as we get into the, the preseason part. The, the couple of games in, injury here, whatever happens. Maybe somebody says, yeah, we love Johnny in college. Let's take a shot. Maybe we'll give a, who knows, a fourth rounder or whatever it might be. And I think Cleveland's trying to salvage a little bit 
to let Johnny start fresh somewhere where he needs to start. I said from the start, and Stephen A. pointed out, only the owner and the quarterback coach that night really wanted him. Everybody else in the draft room was, I don't know. You know, that's a rough situation to go into for a young quarterback. You know, and, and Skip, when I read this, I thought this story was more about the starter, Josh McCown, than it really was about Johnny Manziel. Bingo. Head coaches will play mind games. Yep. You never want your quarterback to get complacent. Regardless of what spring, what type of OTAs he had, how much he's progressed in that offense, I think it was a message for Josh McCown. Hey, listen, we've got this young guy. He is a first-round pick. You've got to do your job. You've okay. got to carry the team. A lot of responsibility. We do trust you. But you have to play at a high level, or we've got this kid right here. I think it was, it was more of a, a message for Josh McCown than it was anything else. Hey, coaches do that here and there. Got it. It's just been such a quarterback carousel there. You'd love to see them get a little bit of consistency, the organization, <laughs> right? Not anytime soon. It doesn't no, like. no, that is not the case. Yeah. Mark, thank you so much for thank you. joining us. We appreciate it. And now for Geico's edition of Stuff Found in Your Car, we go inside your side door pocket. Hello, yes, the crumpled receipt with gum in it. From your anniversary dinner, you sprang for expensive wine, your server was Beth. That dinner was a couple hundred dollars. Money you could get back if you switched to Geico and saved hundreds of dollars on your car insurance. I bet you'd save that receipt. Frame it even. But really, where did I go wrong? Was it the corkage fee? Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit Geico.com today. Elsewhere, in response to a Kobe Bryant interview with GQ back in February, where Bryant was very critical of Phil Jackson, Jackson admitted that he could feel the heat in a conversation with our Charlie Rosen. He went on to say, uh, my good friend Kobe Bryant, yes, quite often I could feel his hatred. I'm sure Kobe was pissed when I wrote in the last season that he was uncoachable. And yes, we were often at loggerheads. He wanted more freedom. And I wanted him to be more disciplined. This is a normal source of friction thing between coaches and players on just about every level of competition. Stephen A., what's your take? Well, I, I can't knock Phil for that. He was completely honest. Uh, matter of fact, outside of the Knicks, um, or rather before he arrived to the Knicks, because I got a whole bunch of problems with him as the executive right now. But prior to that, the only issue I've ever taken with Phil Jackson was the fact that he revealed what he revealed in a book. Had he just said it and not got paid for it, I would not have had any problem with anything that he said about Kobe Bryant because he was just being honest about how he felt. You know, I've known Kobe Bryant for years, and, 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 I'm, and I'm biased towards him because I love the guy. I consider him as real as it gets. I think he's a warrior. I think he's a champion. Um, I think that he's one of those guys that if you're a little kid on a come up, you know, although you might have to work on being doing a better job of ingratiating yourself with your teammates and, and, and sort of being normal to some degree, he's so driven when you talk about making an investment in a superstar player, that's the guy you want to invest in from the perspective that you know he's going to go all out to do everything he can to be on top, and he will take no prisoners along the way. When you have that kind of mentality, you're not going to get along with people sometimes. The difference between him, Skip, and MJ is that Kobe, relatively speaking, not literally, but relatively speaking, He's a recluse. He keeps to himself. He doesn't talk to too many people. He reveals very, very little. Um, and, and as a result, he does so by distancing himself for the most part. It doesn't mean he won't have lunch with you. It doesn't mean he won't talk to you. It doesn't mean he won't be real with you when you're face to face with him. But it means those moments are very, very few and far between, which makes them precious. In the case of somebody like MJ, MJ was above the crowd, but at the same time, he was one of the crowd. He knew how to vibe, to socialize. He was more personable, even though he was incredibly guarded himself. He just came across as incredibly more cool and more personable than Kobe ever has in his career. But I can't knock Phil Jackson for highlighting what he highlighted because it is accurate to some degree, but the very things he's pointing out, I would add, is what makes Kobe a five-time champion, one of the top ten players of all time, and a future first ballot Hall of Famer. So, Stephen A. Smith, when I first read this quote last night, the first person I thought of was you. I felt sad for you because this quote what? said a lot about who Phil Jackson is and who he is not. 
Phil Jackson is the greatest coach of superstar egos that ever walked into an NBA gymnasium. He is not, to me, a general manager, a team builder. He is proving to be a disaster in that area. He's made one bad move after another, and he talks about trading away, just, just sort of getting rid of, of J.R. and Shumpert, which is just mind-boggling to me, but, but that's on down in this interview. But, but when I look at what he did with and to Kobe Bryant, th this is his greatest achievement. He writes a book, did Phil, in which he says Kobe Bryant is uncoachable. Then Phil came back for his second stint, and the silver-tongued devil that he is, he somehow managed to talk Kobe off that ledge, you know, to, to bring him back into the fold, and Kobe bought it. And, and he said, I'm going to give you a little more freedom here. I'm going to let you have a little more reign here within the confines of the offense. And they won two championships together after he had called him uncoachable in a book. So he didn't burn the bridge with Kobe. He managed to come well, back and rebuild that bridge. Well, you can say that, and I guess you can look at it that way. What I, was, what I would respond with that by saying is that um, you also lost Shaq. Shaq departed for Miami. Mm -hmm. We all know that Dr. Buss wanted to hand the reins to Kobe. And I'm here to tell you that if Shaq had stayed, Kobe may not have been a Laker. He may have sure. elected to go to Chicago no, to literally try to succeed MJ. With that being said, you also have to understand that that they went 34 and 48 that year. And above all else, Kobe is trying to win. To go from Phil Jackson to a Rudy Tomjanovich and then for to and then Tomjanovich leaves due to health reasons and then for the last 39 games of the season, you have former uh, you know the assistant to Phil Frank Hamlin on the bench and they go 10 and 29, then of course you're looking for Phil Jackson to come back after being gone for a year because you've missed him and you recognize that it's in your best interest as a franchise to have this guy back in the fold. So you can sit there and talk about, talk about mending fences or what have you. I just think that Kobe recognized that he was committed to winning and that when Phil was talking about him, you know, if as long as Kobe kept it to basketball, then Kobe was going to be just fine because it is, as it pertained to anything else on a personal level, Kobe was going to be incredibly guarded because when you betray Kobe, he ain't getting over that. He might learn to deal with it. He might learn to deal with you, but he ain't getting over it. And you also have to be mindful of what betrayal may be in the eyes of somebody like Kobe. To most of us, is somebody saying one thing, doing another, behind your back, more, more importantly than anything else. And then on top of it all, you know, it's the antithesis of what they told you they would do. So it involves deception, and that's where betrayal comes in for most people. For Kobe Bryant, depending on what day or month it is, betrayal to him may simply be disagreeing with him. You just never know based on his move. That's who he is. But you have to accept it because when you're as great as he has been throughout his career, you have to respect the fact that he's leaning on what worked for him. And you can't knock it. You can knock it later on in life. I can sit there and tell you that Kobe being this way later on in life, I would say I hope he's got a boatload of money saved because, you know, he's got his wonderful wife and beautiful children and, you know, and, and I guess it's select fewer friends. Uh, but, you know, obviously you want to have a, a, a more expansive life than, than that in terms of friends, family, etc. Uh, but as a basketball player, it clearly has worked for him. And it's undeniable that it has worked for him. Okay, but, and but that again, being the case, I can't fault him for it. Okay, but again, back to the book that Phil wrote to make money called The yeah. Last Season, which it was not the last That's season, right. obviously. Of I think Phil not. betrayed Kobe in that book because he not only called he him did. uncoachable, he went on and on and he on did. about how uncoachable he was. And he to did. me, I thought the bridge was burned. I think you thought it was at least on fire, that, that the prospect of Kobe ever playing for Phil Jackson again at that point was incomprehensible. And somehow, no, I, I don't know. I didn't, feel, I, didn't, I didn't feel that way. I didn't feel like it was incomprehensible that he play for Phil. I thought it was incomprehensible that he trust Phil. Meaning on a personal level, Kobe at one time or another will walk into the office and have conversations and stuff like that. I never thought it would get to that point again, although I never asked him about it. 
Whereas somebody like a Jerry West, for example, this is a guy that went out there and got Kobe. You got to remember, Kobe was drafted by the Charlotte Hornets, you know, before they became the Bobcats and then went back to the Hornets. He was drafted by the Charlotte Hornets, 13th overall pick. Jerry West, like a thief in the night, got him for the services of Vlade Divac, and I forgot who else, okay? So he pulled that off the same time he got Shaq. So you got to look at it from the perspective that when you look at Kobe Bryant and the kind of relationship he had with a guy like Jerry West, somebody like Jerry West he had faith in. Remember Del Harris. Del Harris is one of the kindest people you could ever meet. But I'm on the record. I'll never forget, Skip, I was in Utah for that game when Kobe shot those three or four air balls in that playoff series against Carl Malone and John Stockton and the Utah Jazz. He had no business having his number called to take those shots. Dell Harris called his number because he got tired of Kobe talking about how great he was going to be and how he deserved the ball and how he should be getting more playing time and stuff. And he threw him to the wolves. And I think that ruined Dell Harris's head coaching career. He was an assistant later on in Dallas, but it ruined his head coaching career because you don't take a dude and put him in that position to fail, which a lot of people thought Dell Harris did at the time. So Kobe has overcome a lot. And there are people, in fairness to Kobe, that have betrayed him, that did backstab him, that were less than honorable with him. He's not always the villain. To some degree, he was a villain in certain respects with Shaq. But Shaq could have done a better job of bringing him along and, and being that big brother without trying to be a big brother, if you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. He could have massaged that better. He didn't elect to. Yeah. And Kobe, it took Kobe a long time to get over. Kobe didn't get over Shaq trying to swat, trying to slap him at Loyola Marymount in, 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 in Cali until Dwight Howard came to L.A. more than a decade later. And Kobe was Shaq's teammate all of these years, winning championships, jumped in his arm and hugged them when they won a championship and still couldn't stand Shaq because Shaq tried to slap him. Okay. I mean, you got uh, Kobe's different, man. Uh, I He's get just it. different. But back, we're talking about Phil here. Phil proved again and again he could manage and handle superstar egos, Michael Jordan, and obviously with Pippen and Kukoc and Rodman and all the rest, and Co Shaq and Kobe, and yet he's proving he cannot rebuild your Knicks. That's the point. Unfortunately. That's where we're going? <laughs> yep, that's the conclusion. I mean, Drop I, the I, mic. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that's where we was going. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to bring that up? Mm -hmm. Phil keeps bringing it up. The Arizona Cardinals are making history. The team will add a woman as a summer coaching intern. It is believed she is the first female to hold a coaching position of any kind in the NFL. Jen Welter will work with the team's inside linebackers throughout training camp and the preseason. Let's tell you a little bit about her. She was an assistant coach for the Texas Revolution of the Indoor Football League. Last year, she played running back and special teams for the Revolution as well. The first woman to play a non-kicker position for a men's professional football team she played rugby at Boston College and later earned a Ph.D. in psychology. Stephen A. Smith, your reaction? Well, I'm happy, uh, to be quite honest with you. Anytime there's a first in this country, I think there's a good thing. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that I, I, I have no problem whatsoever with more females being involved in coaching. One of the things that, you know, I've always been averse to is women being ostracized from coaching in men's sports but men being allowed to coach women's sports. Um, you know, when I look at the WNBA and I see some of the male coaches coaching in the WNBA, I'm saying to myself, look, why, why, there's a whole bunch of women out there that could coach. How come you can't get a woman to coach in the WNBA? And so if the men can coach in female sports, I certainly believe that women should be coaching in male sports. I am averse to women playing physical sports against men. I don't want to see a woman boxing a man. I don't want to see a woman in the NFL playing against the men. I just don't want to see stuff like that. That's just me. But in terms of coaching, you're talking about your mind, it, it having a cerebral and intellectual approach to the game. Hell, there's a lot of women out there that's probably going to end up being better than a lot of the men out there. I don't think there's any question about that. And I think that our society has evolved to a point 
where we should applaud any time you know a, a woman is given this kind of opportunity I've heard people on the radio stations and beyond you know lamenting the fact that you know there are African American coaches out there who you know work very very hard and you know they they deserve a chance and an opportunity and all of this listen there's been plenty of black coaches who've gotten opportunities and there's been going to be plenty of more black coaches who've gotten an opportunity this is the first as it pertains to a female getting a coaching opportunity in the NFL, albeit on an intern basis. There's a first for everything. Give the woman a chance. Let's see what she's got. Um, and I have absolutely no problem for it. I applaud Bruce Arians and the Arizona Cardinals staff for bringing her on board. I think it's going to be a tremendous opportunity for her. It's going to open the floodgates uh, for a lot more women getting involved in the sport. And there's a whole bunch of women out there who are big time NFL fans and one of them is hosting the show today who by the way you know has had has your history in football in terms of what you've been able to accomplish fantasy football and beyond so I applaud it I love it I think it's a great idea and I hope it continues thank you for saying that mm -hmm. appreciate it yeah I'm with you on this one this is a small step in the right direction only a small one but but a key one because this woman, Jen Welter, as Molly pointed out, actually did play football against men. Not as a kicker, she played football against men. Right. She coached men who were playing a form of professional football, the indoor league, the arena league. And so when she steps on this football field, even as an intern coaching the inside linebackers of the Arizona Cardinals, at least there will already be a measure of respect on the part of those players because they got to say, Wow, she did this. Pretty cool. So they will listen to her, I hope. And, and I'm, I'm going to guess that they will. They'll open their ears to see what she's got to say. And I, I'm trusting she has a whole lot to say. Now, is this Becky Hammond head coaching the Spurs no. Summer League team to a championship? No. no. Is it Becky Hammond opening so many eyes league-wide that now we're hearing buzz? that Becky Hammond realistically could become the first female NBA head coach? No, it's not that. But this is football, which is different than basketball. And I love what, you know, Becky has really flung the door open. And I would like to know, obviously, when I have Bruce here, Bruce Arians, to ask him, maybe somebody will ask him today, did Becky Hammond play any part in your psyche and your decision here to say, gee, I should try this? Maybe. Go ahead. The only, the only other thing that I wanted to piggyback and add to it, when you talked about she played rugby and she played against men or whatever, in no way am I questioning the qualifications of a woman playing in sports against men. I'm just saying to you the physical, violent sports is not something I'm comfortable watching a woman physically compete against a man because I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want him to get hurt. You understand? She might hurt most men, but you know, you know, when it comes to physicality, I'm, I, you know, just being raised by five women, I'm, I'm always, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant about that. I don't want to see a woman boxing a man. I don't want to yep. see a woman in the UFC fighting a man or something like that. Not, they, they might win for crying out loud, and I know that. I'm just saying that the physical part of it makes me uncomfortable. But in terms of coaching. I have no problem with it whatsoever. I love the fact that more females are getting this opportunity. They're pioneers. They're opening doors. And uh, much respect to, to both Becky Hammond and Jen Walter as well. Walter tweeted, I'm honored to be a part of this amazing team. Special thanks to Bruce Arians and the Arizona Cardinals. The Cavs re-signed restricted free agent guard Matthew Del Vidova to a one-year deal worth $1.2 million. Delhi filled in for the injured Kyrie Irving and came up big with 19 points and a series clinching win over the Bulls and 20 points in the Game 3 win over the Warriors in the finals. Skip, are you surprised this deal was so low? Stephen A. Smith, I was dumbfounded that Delhi had to settle for $1.2 million. That is chump change to Stephen A. Smith. $1.2 <laughs> million? Are you kidding me? The man who propelled the Cleveland Cavaliers to a two games to one lead, the, the man who made so many clutch plays down the stretch, so many clutch baskets, saved LeBron's bacon again and again, 
guarded Steph Curry the way I think nobody guarded him all year in those first three games when he shot 25 for 63, clearly bothered by Delhi. Only 32% did Steph make from the three-point line in the first three games. Delhi put the Cavaliers in position to win the championship. Then it was up to LeBron. Game four, your house. Close the deal, LeBron. And as you said, he ran out of gas. But Delhi makes 1.2 million. Does it, LeBron makes, what's he make per game? Probably 1.2 million, right? Come on. Skip Bayless, <clears throat> here's the deal. Matthew Dellavedova deserved one, more than 1.2 million. They are cap strapped. They're, you know, tugging on the seat of the luxury tax. We all know all the money that Cleveland has spent this off season. But they went out and acquired Mo Williams. You know why they acquired Mo Williams? Because they needed a legitimate backup point guard to Kyrie Irving. They needed somebody to see the backup skip and somebody that could actually step in and really, really produce for mm -hmm. you. Now, I understand that Matthew Dellavedova had 20 points in game three. Then he had 10 points in game four. Then he had five points in game five. And then in the closeout game six, you know how many points he had, Skip? One. When everybody started raving all of, making all of this noise about him being the Steph stopper and what have you, the league MVP went berserk on this brother and reminded everybody, I'm on another level. And that's the deal with Matthew Dellavedova. He works hard. He goes out there, he gives full effort. He really, really defends. He's annoying. He gets in you. But at the end of the day, he's Matthew Dellavedova. Hmm. He is a really good defensive player because he's a pest. He is a pos probably below average offensive player. He's lucky. He deserved more than a $1.2 million. But let's not get too excited. The Cleveland Cavaliers upgraded their point guard spot because they went out and got Mo Williams. That's what they needed to do before the playoffs. They needed to listen to their players telling them throughout the season. And I love the job that David Griffin did. I think he did an exceptional job as GM. But they need, he needed to listen to the players telling them all year long, you needed a viable backup point guard. Had they had one. And, and left Delhi coming off the bench even behind the backup, then they might have had a better chance. Unfortunately, they did not. I love Mo Williams. I said that day that was a great move. I can't knock that at all. But Delhi showed me something in those first three games. And again, as you say, 20 in that game three. But he was fighting his behind off to guard Steph. So it's okay for LeBron to run out of gas in game four. But it's not okay for Delhi to run out of gas in game five, six, and on, right? So, so oh, come on. We'll, we'll give, oh, give him on. a break. Are you, are, you comparing, are you comparing the load that he had to that of yeah, LeBron? Yeah, I am. Remember that? They, they had to take him to the Wait. hospital for give you know, him an IV for dehydration. Oh you know what? Because he wasn't three. accustomed to playing. That's why. That's oh, like well, me that's... deciding to go on a treadmill for, for for five to eight miles. <laughs> You'd have to take me to the hospital too. You understand? I mean, you don't give me that. I don't want to hear that nonsense about Matthew Delavadova. He was lucky. He was on the floor in the finals. He was lucky. He was on the floor in the lucky. finals. Just well, stop LeBron it. was lucky. Just he was on it. the floor in games <laughs> two and three. Have did, a good day, Skip. Yeah, did he not make bro. key plays down it's the stretch? It's good to see you, Skip. No, he did. Bye. Yeah, Bye, Skip. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Take care, Skip. Bye. Matthew yeah. Delaver. Yeah. Bye, Skip. Hey, turn him <laughs> off. Stop it. Turn off that Stop monitor. it. Goodbye, Skip. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. One point in a closeout game. Yeah. One. Yeah. And, one. And one, one. point <laughs> two million. That's a free throw. One point two million. It's a free throw. Come on. You, you tip one point two million every day in New York City. Tomorrow, uh, the guys like are going to be back and some like Pac-12 coaches, same time, 10 a.m. on ESPN2. Uh -huh. Thanks so much for hanging with us. Have yes, a great yes, day. Yes. The Washington Nationals are sitting high atop the NLE standings, but the Mets are lurking right behind them. They go head-to-head -head this weekend. The pregame Saturday is at 6 Eastern and Sunday at 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio.